Hello, folks. I'm here about a minute early for Unfound on the Ground number 11. Please feel free to give any feedback in the chat if sound is an issue. Um, I am tuning in about a minute early with this new formatting that we have. And um, my apologies. I am broadcasting from an undisclosed location. Um, in the future, as we shift to this new format, thanks to feedback from you good folks in the think tank and discussion from uh, among Ed and Natasha and other members of the team, we have shifted format to YouTube Live, which you're used to through the live show from Ed and the uh, think tank work. And so this is the approach we're using where the uh, link has been distributed to uh, think tank members to participate. I have posted, hello, Paula, I have posted the um, disclaimers there, and I'm going to jump into this now because it is 930. This is Unfound on the Ground number 11, a historical overview of missing persons cases. Um this will be recorded, video and audio, including the text chat. Uh, chat participation is an option. Uh, so as you as you want to contribute, I will be reading the, the chat and rendering and involving what you're saying. Uh, and uh, for the journalistic, promotional and or commercial purposes of Unfound, the audio and video recording, including text chat of this digital meeting will be distributed by Unfound. And that's at some point um, in the future is determined by Ed and Natasha. By participating in this digital meeting, you agree to give unfound permission to use the rendering of your words for journalistic, promotional, and or commercial purposes with no compensation to you from unfound, its assistants, its affiliates, its partners, et cetera. Hello, Kathy. Hello, everyone. Um, again, welcome to Unfound on the Ground number 11 in our new formatting. And bear with me, folks. I have, uh, this is this is new. I'm not going to have as much dexterity as Ed uh, with this format, but we're going to get better. Uh, as always, Unfound on the unfoundpodcast.com, the unfoundpodcast.com. Please continue to use that as a resource. At some point, someone's going to watch this. This is going to be distributed. So please visit the website, share the website, theunfoundpodcast.com. Of course, we'll continue to update data gems. And as always, we're behind on that. I'm behind on that, not Ed and Natasha. However, one advantage of this new format is that if I have a link that I want to mention, which I'm going to do right now, I can post it, right? I can post it. Um, so let me just get my bearing straight here. I can post it. So for instance, right now, I'm going to post this. And this is, we do resource sharing. And so I had uh, wanted to mention this. We're always talking about awareness and prevention. We've talked about trafficking and the human, human trafficking hotline.org. There's a phone number on there, 1-888-373-7888, 1-888-373-7888, and uh, humantraffickinghotline.org. You can read and see what they do in terms of providing resources to people and providing information to law enforcement. And since we're always, and there's some, some other communication options on there, and since we're always thinking about uh, prevention and helping people real time, and I always try to continue to share those resources, then I did want to share that. So that's an advantage of this. So as we talk through items tonight, um, there's going to be uh, an opportunity to share that material, okay? And of course, the data gems will be updated, of course, for sure. So as always, let me give the usual disclaimer for me. Again, I'm Eric Rabowski. I'm um, you know, work in academia, teaching and study of communication. Uh, I am, I have been a guest on Unfound. I do some cold case journalism on the side. 
uh, part of the Unfound Assisting Team. Uh, as always, my words here do not necessarily reflect the uh, positions or views of my employing university. Uh, the chat's going to be out there. Any of the links that I share, be, you know, feel free to, to capture on your own. Again, they will be put into data gems eventually. Uh, again, please contribute tonight by text. That's how we're doing it now, as always, with Unfound on the ground, just like with the larger Unfound platform, as I call it, framework, right? Accuracy, awareness, truth, facts, justice, and so forth. And so we're continuing that. We, we had this idea for this uh, historical overview with some particular focus on coverage. And the more I uh, data gems, that's on the unfoundpodcast.com website. Uh, I don't have the specific link right now. Uh, if Natasha is here, I would ask her to post that link. There's actually two places on the, the, the site, but it is on the unfoundpodcast.com website. Uh, data gems is where we post uh, the ongoing sort of resource list from Unpound on the ground, and these provide an, these are resources that people can use, whatever their interest or involvement is in uh, missing persons cases. So um, that is where it's at. And if Natasha's not here, that's okay. I can make sure to re-email that out. But uh, it is it is anchored on the it is connected to the unfoundpodcast.com website. Uh, for sure. So we are, we really have two considerations tonight. And as I was doing research for this episode, there's so much material out there. This is probably going to be another one where in the future we're going to have a follow up uh, because there's just so much material. So sort of the two layers tonight that I wanted to, to look at uh, are obviously some of us have some cases that are historical that we we want to highlight obviously i have some and and then also you know why why is it relevant to be thinking about these cases historically including the coverage element um in terms of past present and future right what do we learn from it um how does it support and enhance some of the things that are important to us in terms of research and analysis and awareness Again, we try to talk about things here that no matter what you're doing or what your interest, whether it's a highly interested reader or listener, someone who is uh, doing the um, some sort of journalism or, or, or something along those lines on your own, if you're involved in awareness raising, public relations, advocacy, right? Those are the sorts of resources that we're trying to provide and it looks like that Natasha is going to post the data gems link um, and I, I don't know and I should have asked Ed or Natasha if uh, folks who tune in can post their own links and, and we don't need to, to do that of course Natasha may be able to do that anyway but regardless I'll make sure that goes out um, I'm going to start with one and then we'll, we'll, we'll um, sort of go through you know, one case, it's, it's, it's been a while, and, and it's, it, it continues to um, be on the mind of, of the American culture and, and to some extent, pop culture. Uh, the, of recent note, maybe, and I'm not endorsing or critiquing the movie. I'm certainly not endorsing the, the, the scenario that's in the movie, uh, The Irishman, uh, which, which came out a couple years ago. Of course, that's based on the uh, the life, or, or at least the narrative that Frank Sheeran claims with regard to his involvement with Hoffa and then his involvement in the Hoffa disappearance. So the Jimmy Hoffa disappearance um, is a significant um, aspect of American life. You know, it happened in the 1970s. There are resources available, and I, I'm just posting here the uh, FBI uh, vault uh, page. You know, I've mentioned in the past the maryfarrell.org website. Again, there's things you can do with free access. There are added benefits to paid access, but they also have in uh, their records, uh, you know, government records that pertain to 
to Jimmy Hoffa, Jimmy Hoffa's disappearance. Um, the I'm just closing this out here. You can see on the FBI page, of course, Jimmy, someone like Jimmy Hoffa was on the government's horizon well before he disappeared. Um, as we know, he was the um, you know head of the Teamsters for a number of years and had gotten into trouble on his own. And there was always discussions of his involvement with organized crime and so forth. But um, Hoffa had a particular commitment to the Teamsters, there's no doubt about that. And um, so, you know, culminating with all that, right, 1975, uh, Hoffa disappeared. And, um, you know, the Detroit News here, and I got a, a nice article I'll post just looking back as well as looking at some discussions. Um, you know, 1975, he vanished from the parking lot uh, of the Marcus Red Fox restaurant in the Detroit area. Uh, that would be Bloomfield Township, um, and this this article actually provides uh, it's it's kind of tied to a discussion that I'm actually interested in now. And when I talk about this, I am not uh, endorsing at this point any particular uh, hypothesis or theory about um, Hoffa's disappearance. I think there are many interesting uh, aspects. Uh, where there may be folks who are getting close. Obviously, like with many of these older cases, which with the passage of time, um, there may be things that are more difficult to ascertain. However, you can also argue with the passage of time, uh, some historical perspective, uh, especially as, as people obtain documents or claims about this or that person to whom they spoke, uh, more insights. Again, that's one of the areas of why these understanding this history is important. So uh, before I keep going on here, I'm going to ask, has any, anyone who's uh, here tonight uh, thought much or studied much about the, the Hoffa case? And just chat away if you're, if you have something you want to say. Okay, and and if someone chats while I'm going, I'll I'll just try to stop, and I'm and again just bear with me because I'm getting a little newer to this, and I think I got a handle on it, and I'll try to get better every time. Um, so one and again, I'm not necessarily endorsing a particular um, view, but one gentleman who is recognized as I didn't yeah okay Linda, it is incredibly interesting. There's no doubt about. Natasha, not yet. Okay. Um, one gentleman who is particularly known to be an expert, right? Even if one disagrees with his, um, some of his ideas, is a gentleman named Dan Moldea. Uh, M O L D E A dot com is his website. I'm, I'll, I'm sharing a link here with some of his materials um, with regard to, he's still on the case, basically. Um, yeah, I, I do. Re I have, I have seen some or all of the Hoffa movie and, uh, the Irishman movie is it definitely gives another, another angle. Um, yep. Okay. Kathy. Um, okay. So it looks like this is one. And again, it's, it's, it's significant, you know, folks go missing all the time, but when a prominent union boss who had or allegedly had uh, mafia connections uh, goes disappearing, and certainly that's going to capture the attention uh, of folks. So this Dan Moldea is somewhat of an expert on, and again, I'm, I've shared the link there from his site. So there's been some recent traction um, with uh, Dan Moldea and uh, actually a Fox reporter, Eric Sean. And um, there's some uh, there's a look, and I'm not saying this is going to turn up anything, although it is interesting um, that there, there's a look to um, New Jersey and uh, a particular um, uh, area uh, where there's a, a garbage dump or 
or landfill or something along those lines where um, there seems to be the possibility that, you know, based on a certain scenario of, of Hoffa's disappearance, that um, that uh, they may find the body. Uh, it's actually maybe piquing the interest of the authorities too to to get a warrant. You can read about it. Again, I'm not wedded to a particular theory, but I find this fascinating, especially because, um, you know, the Hoffa story, right, overlaps with so many other aspects of things that we might be interested in, even in terms of missing persons cases or other sorts of cold cases, even if they're not missing persons cases, uh, because you're dealing with, you know, documents pertaining to organized crime and politics and unions and, you know, how all those things play out. Sometimes these, this, you know, especially with the Hoffa case, right? It covers various geographical areas, possibly New Jersey, so forth. So, um, and even if you don't necessarily, you know, embrace, and again, I'm not endorsing it, the, the Frank Sheeran account of things. Again, there are aspects of it that, that could be true or might be true or are true, even if the whole story is not true uh, from the movie The Irishman that you still uh, say, well, wow, that's interesting. Okay, we need to research that. So the Hoffa case is a case where you see the importance of um, the um, understanding a lot of the things that we've talked about on these programs. I'm posting here also an interesting um, video from a, a local library in, in, in uh, Michigan pertaining to um, just the the red fox, the Marcus red fox, and then there's some discussion in there on the on the um, Hoffa case, and so you know there is the possibility there's some folks who uh, in the you know in the you know, Hoffa community, let's say people that research Hoffa. Uh, okay, welcome, Laura. Okay, welcome, Laura. And folks, as you get through, uh, there's that page on the that. So it has piqued folks' interest whether this New Jersey situation will play out. Um, I haven't made it a point much to, you know, as of you know July twenty six, twenty twenty one, where they're at. I, there, there is some since the last year or two, some, some interest in this, uh, New Jersey situation. And I am sending the, another piece here where, uh, there's some discussion about folks and, uh, where there might be some, some interest in Moldea's approach. So, you know, when you talk about the Hoffa case, so just let's assume, right, which seems like a regional reasonable assumption, that he was hit by organized crime. Well, then the next question is: is well, where did what did they do with him? Right? Was it was he cremated? Was he put in a drum? Obviously, as we know, over the years there's been many claims that Hoffa's body's here and Hoffa's body's here, and then it turns out not to be the case. Um, you know, was he was he you know disposed of as this way or that way? Uh, well, maybe, maybe. There's this 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 waste area in New Jersey where it might be, but time will tell. Regardless, even if that turns out not to be true, there may be other there might be other true things that are uncovered. Uh, another gentleman who seems to have some expertise on uh, the Hoffa situation, and or at least a good expertise on piecing together at least credible perspectives. And again, I'm not endorsing any particular idea or theory of what happened to Hoffa tonight, but uh, a guy named Al Prophet, and uh, he has a, a YouTube channel, and I'm just posting. Uh, yeah, it was easier, right? there. It, especially, Linda, if there were folks who were very used to getting rid of, rid of bodies, like people who did you know, assassinations for organized crime, no question, you know, they had they had a system, right? So I'm sharing some resources here that, uh, you know, if you get interested in the case, then, you know, that's something that you may want to pursue, you know, and think about. 
Um, so let me take a break from this. I've mentioned the Hoffa case. Does anyone have any cases, historical cases, that they'd like to mention? Obviously, I have some more. Um, you know, this is since the 70s. It's not incredibly far back in history, but my grandfather disappeared due to the mafia. Okay, Linda. Um, that's interesting. Not sure how much you're willing to get into that here, but that might be something at some point. If you wanted to further that conversation, talk to Ed or myself um, or share what you will here. But, yeah, that, that, that is certainly something that folks who get uh, inter interested in these cases and you start to look into the documents. There's so many, the FBI documents and, and other government documents and old newspaper reports. Remember, I've mentioned in the past, we've talked about it's a great research tool, newspapers.com, newspapers.com. Right, of course, that is a paid service, so, you know, that is uh, what it is, but it is a good uh, resource, and, um, you know, and it does grow. It's certainly not the only, uh, okay, right, He ref Linda, he refused to pay protection racket money, basically, um, for sure. Okay, Linda, when did that happen? I, you don't have to get too specific, but do you know when that happened? Just was it the 50s, the 60s, the 40s, the 70s? Okay, and while Linda, again, I don't, you don't have to get too specific other than that here. I'd just be interested to know how far back in time that was. Okay, well, maybe that's something. You can be inspired, you know, you know, per your own time and comfort level to to research, right? That's that's what we want to do, um, and learn more about. Okay, now I want to mention here, and I'm gonna. We know we have had um, Ed in the past has interviewed. Yeah, that'd be great, Linda, and again, chat with with Ed or myself. Or both of us for some tips or so forth. I'm posting now the um, interview that Ed did with um, Megan Good of the Charlie Project. We know that the Charlie Project is a tremendous web. Uh, okay. Yeah, now, Laura, and that Marvin Clark, and I, I opted not to. I'm glad you brought it up. I believe he was a, was he a sheriff's deputy or some sort of law enforcement? I believe that might be one. If we do another, we will probably do another historical, um, you know, follow up. Um, and I, and I have Evan, Evelyn Hartley, of course, on the list of possible, uh, depending on time cases to discuss tonight, but yeah, you know, the Marvin Clark case, that may be one, uh, and you can say more about it here, Laura, if you'd like, or certainly in the future we can, when we do another uh, uh, sort of follow-up uh, overview of, of history, we can do more about Marvin Clark in terms of resources for sure. So we have Megan Good and Ed had interviewed Megan. We already know charlieproject.org is a tremendous resource. Uh, we've mentioned it. We know that you good folks are familiar with it. And um, hopefully this real-time link sharing is helpful. I hope so, folks. And so there it is, charlieproject.org. So if you get going with that and you go to the um, – and just this, you know, this FAQ, Frequently Asked Questions on that website is very helpful. But, you know, one of the, the key uh, aspects of – Charlie Project, of course, is, is well, why is it named the Charlie Project? And so we go back to the case of Charlie Ross, which was, and, and Megan has here a, uh, some blog posts here, and I'm, I'm posting them here for you if you want to follow along. Little Charlie Ross. So we're going back to uh, Charles Brewster Ross, born in 1870. So we're in Germantown, Pennsylvania. And so you can see there, and some of you might already, of course, be familiar with this. And for those who will view this material when it's uh, publicized, 
Um, and I'm also posting here a resource uh, from the Pennsylvania Center for the Book, which is uh, connected to the uh, Penn State University System Library uh, framework, whatever. And there's some um, references there that may be helpful to you. But um, Megan gives a nice, okay, uh, Mary, okay, Kathy, thank you. Mary Jane Van Gilder's disappearance, 1945-46 uh, from Ohio. You know, one of the things I noticed um, as I was going through just a range of historical you know, searches on the internet, and again, back to what we've talked about in the past on these episodes, right, that there's so many resources state by state, right, and whether it's journalistic or governmental, where you might, you know, find the cold case list or see what some of the older cases are in a particular state. And so, and again, obviously we'll be noting these for ongoing discussion. Okay. So we have, and, and anyone else can chime in while we're doing this, while I'm, I'm going on here. So Megan gives a really good, uh, overview and if you look also too you'll see in the article that I just shared from the Pennsylvania Center from the book or Pennsylvania Center for the book as we start to think about coverage right um, you know at the time uh, when Charlie disappeared the idea of a kidnapping or an abduction wasn't really something that was on you know the minds of the folks in terms of dealing with that and so forth but you know oh, but it did create a lot of it, it got and garnered a lot of attention um and so you know if you look down towards the end of that article and you certainly couple that with with megan's article or here blog post um there you know, this would be something that this case, um, you know, would be something that would be consequential and uh, did sort of raise the idea of these types of cases to the minds, right, of media, law enforcement, general public, and so forth. Now, that article is from 2010 on that Pennsylvania Center for the Book. Um, of course, you know, Megan has a nice blog post on her blog, which I've shared with you, right? CharlieRoss.wordpress.com. There's a tag search there that you can run with. That's from about 08, and then she does some ongoing updates um, up through 2020. So, you know, a couple, two updates. But the other thing that's interesting, especially with someone who's as thorough and focused as uh, Megan, let me just look at the chat here. Um, okay, thank you, Laura. Uh, not sure if Marvin Clark was a police officer. He was in his 70s when he disappeared, uh, was supposed to meet his daughter in Portland and never showed up. Um apparently partly paralyzed. Interesting. So then these are helpful insights. And I know folks can like read the chat in the future, but I'm trying to render what we're doing to, to have to, to acknowledge this so we can keep that discussion feel. Also too, folks, as we go through this, please, and as we we're trying new things based on your feedback, um, keep giving us feedback. Keep giving Ed feedback. Keep giving me feedback because um, we do listen to it. You know, we think about things as a team, but, uh, you know, we want to continue. You know, it's hard. Great work, folks. We're on this episode number 11. But, uh, you know, your feedback and participation uh, are helpful. The other thing I find interesting about these, you know, thinking about why the history is important, because now all of a sudden you're like, you learn about other cases. And again, Megan is so thorough uh, and focused. And, and so I'm reading her blog post here article mentioning Charlie Ross. And that's January 24th, 2010. You have the link. It's on the tag search. Well, then she mentioned some other cases, Richard Cox, Ambrose Bierce. Okay. I haven't researched those cases like at all, really, other than just quick Google search. 
maybe in the future I'll get interested in those just in terms of not necessarily digging too deep into them, but just reading more about them. So, you know, with the passage of time, as more folks try to, you know, scholars, journalists, etc., dig into these cases, then you hear about other cases, you know, you, you, you know, it's, it's more paths for research. So like that too, again, Megan's very thorough and focused. Um, so this, this, this Charlie Ross case, little Charlie Ross case, that's, that's, that's an earlier case. Um, for sure. Let me look at the chat here, make sure I'm not missing any of this. Has anyone had a chance? I know we're all very familiar with Megan's work and charlieproject.org, charlieproject, that's C-H-A-R-L-E-Y, project.org. Has anyone done any follow-up or study of this Charlie Ross case? Again, I'm just giving a very um, efficient but clear overview here with attribution to Megan and, of course, this Pennsylvania Center for the Book page. Has anyone of our, of our guests, of our chat folks tonight, um, done any reading on the Charlie Ross case but more than what I've mentioned? Never heard of it. Okay, Kathy, here's another path to dig into. And I put the links out there. Um, and this is, this is what Charles Brewster Ross, this is why the Charlie Project is called the Charlie Project. So we have that case. And again, we're going back to the the 19th century. Okay, so something to keep in mind there. And again, at the end of that uh, Pennsylvania Center for the book piece that I just uh, shared, there's some other uh, resources that you can uh, link to, or if they're not immediately available on the internet, you might be able to find them and so forth, maybe at your local library or maybe on your own. And maybe do some of your own in regard. Okay, back to Linda. Um, it looks like he was marked as dead in 1940. Okay, so that's definitely digging back for sure. Uh, yep, okay, Laura. Keep going on the clerk's case. And uh, yeah, and I would encourage us all to re-listen to the, listen to and or re-listen to the, the Megan Good interview. And then... Um, yeah, obviously her website's tremendous, but the Charlie Ross case is fascinating. You talk about history, right? That's that's important. So let's let me keep moving on here, and and I'll just sort of intertwine, you know, some of this. We can see through studying the history how certain cases, right, sort of you know capture the attention of the public mind. Um. You know, and like in the case of, you know, especially in the time of the late, you know, mid to late 19th century, when, um, you know, a, a single case um, has such an impact um, to get folks interested in, because um, we take for granted today, I mean, we have legitimate discussions like we did in a recent episode about public perceptions of missing persons cases and we can look at data and have debates on you know disparity and coverage but you know, just the idea of covering uh, abductions kidnappings and the occurrence of it in terms of media and, and and how law enforcement works right we maybe for some ways unfortunately take that for granted but so these cases have an impact had an impact that's clear and, uh, you know, the reality is, as I would say, even after all these years, um, they still need to be pursued. They still need to be, we still need to be aware of it. And um, we, um, you know, maybe, maybe as time goes on, I don't know how definitively, although I always try to hold up hope that the, the truth can come out, we need to... Uh, pursue these cases. Okay, I'm going to move on here. Make sure um, if anyone has any other cases that they want to mention before I keep going. Okay, I'm going to keep going. 
another one. Now this is, um, I guess, uh, to, from a certain view, a missing persons case, and also a, a, a suspect, and which is, I guess you would call it a cold case hijacking. And of course, I'm talking about uh, D.B. Cooper. Has anyone heard of D.B. Cooper? Uh, part of the issue is who is D.B. Cooper, who was D.B. Cooper, what happened to him uh, after he you know, parachuted from the plane. Is, uh, has anyone here heard of D.B. Cooper? Okay. Uh, Linda, you're talking about uh, D.B. Cooper is fascinating. And again, folks, as I talk about D.B. Cooper, there's different folks. Yeah, thank you, Linda. Yes. Um, I'm not. There, there's some interesting ideas about who D.B. Cooper is or was. I, I'm not endorsing it. I've heard various interviews over the years, different media outlets, um, or seen you know, different things. Uh, it's fascinating, okay? And you talk about a case, again, that had... Uh, law enforcement impact, media impact, to some extent, I think, although I want to corroborate some of this influence on public policy, I mean, just not D.B. Cooper, but just the idea of vulnerability. I, 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 I've I, heard that, and I, I'm not, I don't have anything to cite on that right now, but um, to be researched, so I'm saying that tentatively, and, I, and, and so I'm saying that with that's not an original thought of mine, but I've, I've heard that in possibly credible discussions um, in media. Uh, but again, not claiming that as original thought. But so, yeah, um, certainly still gets coverage at the time. Uh, now, it looks like since about 2016, um, the FBI had shifted away from, um, you know, investigating it in terms of resources you'll see that i have a an fbi piece there um you know certainly they're saying hey although we're not actively investigating this case if you have anything that's significant please come forward this is interesting here from the fbi website this is the third link that's the D.B. Cooper plane ticket, right? Again, why, why is the history important? Um, and again, I'm just going right from the, the, the uh, FBI site here. The third one I shared, Artifact of the Month, July 2016th, D.B. Cooper plane ticket, November 24th, 1971. A man calling himself Dan Cooper approached the counter of the Northwest Orient Airlines in Portland, Oregon, and used cash to buy a one-way ticket on a flight to Seattle, Washington. Okay, and so forth. Um, the plane was hijacked, um, but of course he jumped from the plane. Um, and of course there are different ideas here. Of course the FBI acknowledges, and maybe we will never know what happened to D.B. Cooper after he jumped the plane and again as they say they're not actively pursuing it but if you have something tangible certainly bring it forth um did they actually find some of the money um i personally had to catch up a little on db cooper here for this i used to keep an eye on it once in a while in the media um I'm not sure on the newest research for sure on whether they've actually found or traced any of the money, right? And so um, is anyone else? And I'm just going to go to 2009 here, archives. Uh, this is from 2009. Um That's 09. Is anyone familiar with anything newer on the money? 
from that and i'm just this is from the 09 piece there so yeah these, these are things and and again i've thought about you know um re taking some time not that i'm going to jump on the case to, to to you know become a deeply involved uh, but i i would like to do more reading on it and again i've heard some good interviews over the year and i know that there's some arguments for this or that person and you know would db cooper even be alive anymore um anyone else want to chime in on the um db cooper case again he's he would be both i guess a disappearance and a suspect and i've shared some materials that if you want to get interested in it you could you know, you could pursue, um, you know, for your own reading, for sure. So um, as we go, and again, if you have any cases you want to mention, please put them out there. The other thing I want to maybe get a little more specific on, and I've mentioned a few things, is, um, you know, why, why is it important to know this history? Of course, it's important. We know this from those of us who care, unfound people in particular, right? That, that that these folks matter, right? Whoever they, whom whomever they are, um, we care about justice. We care about truth. Uh, but of course, as we look back in time and and we start to really see the importance of some of the things we've talked about, you know, we look at old you know government records, things that are disclosed over time claims that scholars or journalists make based on on this or that argument um you know uh, folks come out you know again with the hoffa case uh you know frank sheeran uh, you know, made some claims before he died uh, about you know his involvement with the hoffa case um, again i'm not endorsing them but that's obviously the basis for the movie uh, the irishman um, I do want to acknowledge that Frank Sheeran and, and a, I believe a lawyer put out a book. I do not remember the name of it right now, um, but it's out there if you want to find it. You know, I just I'm mentioning it, uh, but I'm not necessarily endorsing that. So people make claims over time. People say, well, I was involved in this. I was involved in that. Again, we're, we know the importance of facts and accuracy. It keeps that on our mind. It's absolutely fascinating when you dig back into some of these these older cases and, and you, you have to deal with what the media was reporting and, you know, things were, were inaccurately or, or accurately reported and trying to dig through those documents and the sorts of research that we've talked about in the past. And if you really want to dig into it from a journalistic standpoint, you know, or, you know, the possibility of talking to anybody that might have some immediate or even secondhand something like why well, i always say right someone out there knows something or knows someone who knows something but then having to corroborate that so it really shows you the importance of this and i also think and, and i have this in mind in terms of our last audience our last episode and other episodes right as you you start to take a step back and and, and like in the case of the charlie ross case or other cases uh, how uh, a case or a set of cases uh, might sort of impact the public mind. You know, obviously the the media uh, heightening. You know, law enforcement, law enforcement policies. By the way, folks, just a little precursor, and not, and, and it probably will be the next episode. You know, having a unfound on the ground when we talk about some of the different uh, laws and and acts and sort of the legal political environment tied to missing persons cases over the years, right? And so it's it, those things are important. The practices, the influences of how people even look at missing persons cases. Again, 2021, um, you know, it's, it's, it's just something that's part of the fabric, unfortunately, of our media and, and, and even everyday discussion environment. But you look back through time and how specific cases influenced uh, things in terms of law enforcement and the poli the politics and legal and, and legal issues of of how missing persons cases were dealt with, and uh, you know there certainly was an awareness uh, component that that played a role uh, over time. Obviously, 
the the various means of media. Uh, so I guess I Linda, that's you know, I guess we could debate about technical terms. I personally see the DB Cooper case as more as a a missing person because the he he literally, you know, did did uh, jump the plane and they don't know who he was. They don't know what happened to him. I guess one could say, well, Jack the Ripper, which by the way, as we know, there are still people uh, in, involved in, in researching uh, Jack the Ripper. You know, I guess we could say because of, of he, th this, this idea, this figure of Jack the River, Red Ripper took on a certain, uh, we don't know who he is, right? They have some ideas. I guess in some ways it could be approached like a missing person. Uh, that's a great question. If anyone wants to chime in on that, that's a good one. Certainly we know that there are a series of unsolved murders, okay? So I guess like in the case of D.B. Cooper, there's an unsolved hijacking. And so with an unsolved murder, and you don't know who the person is, and they could have gone this way or that way, I guess you could approach it like a missing person. That's a great question. I've not thought of that. Or, you know, maybe I have remotely, but that's a great, great, great question. Uh, certainly, you'd bring some of the same mindsets and methods to that, right? Uh, if you don't know who the person is, where did they go? What happened to them? Uh, although no one ever reported them missing, right? Um, in the sense that we think about it. I guess in the D.B. Cooper case, it was that way too, but he jumped the plane. And we don't know who it is, and we don't know what happened to him after. Again, if anyone wants to share any thoughts as we're going through this. Another case, of course, is especially when you think about prominent people, right? The Lindbergh kidnapping, right? So there's an FBI piece there. And, um, you know, we think about the, uh, of course, Charles uh, Lindbergh. Um, Charles Lindbergh Jr., of course, was was uh, kidnapped 1932. Again, I have it from the FBI.gov page I just shared with you from its history section. And, you know, there were a lot of, again, this, this of course, Lindbergh family prominent. And you can see on that page, you know, aspects of the investigation, aspect, you know, were, were, it had certainly political, uh, influential people involved. Uh, eventually, a, a man uh, named uh, Hopped, Hopped, Hauptman um, was was uh, arrested and convicted, and uh, eventually, after some legal machinations, uh, Richard Bruno Richard Hauptman was electrocuted for this uh, um, situation. The Lindbergh kidnapping again. I shared the link there from the FBI.gov in the. Uh, history section. There's a uh, obviously been a lot of discussion over the years on that. Yeah, Charles Lindbergh. And so again, this is something. Yeah, Kathy, I see that. Um, we know a lot of folks know a little bit about it. Again, if one wanted to study an interesting case overall, as well as to see the influence, of course, Lindbergh family already prominent, and the sort of attention that's going to be able to be brought to it, and the different things they tried to uh, find find his son. Um, so that FBI dot gov write up is interesting for sure. Anyone else have any cases they want to mention as I go through these? Okay. That's okay if you don't. Another one here is, uh, this is one that Ed has suggested, who honestly I was not familiar with, I don't think. Joseph Force Crater, who was a judge. And that's another Pennsylvania connection there and this is another pennsylvania center for the book right so he was born and i'm going off this pennsylvania center for the book page 
born in 1889 in Easton, Pennsylvania. Okay, so of course there's some obviously discussion over time, and this one's interesting. Of course, it's a it's a case that's it's it's um, famous, um, but it's also as you can see a case where there are oh Natalie Holloway, absolutely Linda. I mean, it's, it, it, it is historical in the sense of recent his, history, um, no doubt about it. And, you know, we tend to think about these historical cases back, back, back in time. But, you know, 5, 10, 15, 20 years, whether it be missing persons cases or other sorts of, of, of uh, situations that, that, are, that are unsolved murders or so forth, um, that's still part of history. That's still part of the historical overview. So uh, Judge Crater, of course, and I'm just jumping here. Um, you'll see again, just like on the other Pennsylvania Center for the Book page, there's some references at the bottom. Um, as you can see, uh, as the page says, uh, the case lost some attention as the years wore on. And then there was a uh, memoir published, 1961. Uh, and again, I'm, I'm going off here by Stella Wheeler Crater, The Empty Robe. Um, then that, that waned. And then in 2005, um, there was a letter found, uh, do not open till my death, okay? And so um, that letter contained information uh, about, you know, the claims about um, killing Crater. Um, however, um, the question is, can that be corroborated? It seems to lend a plausible uh, aspect to the case. Um, there is a good link on there, and I'm going to share it too. Um, that from an ABC News call, and it's what this page says, there's been no uh, developments in the case since that time, although more extensive research would be needed. But you're, you're getting the, the crux or the, the gist of this. And boy, that, that's something too, right? Over time, um, how things are found whether it be a letter or something else that may or may not shed light on a case. Um, this is why, you know, when we're thinking about researching the older cases, really any case, right? We've talked about being thorough and comprehensive and accurate, but we can certainly see how it's relevant with these historical cases, especially with the passage of time. We're looking at old media reports. We're sifting through primary source documents. We're looking, of course, what scholarly material may be out by historians or criminologists and so forth. Um, we're, we're corroborating, we're thinking, we're finding uh, people to talk to as possible in the ways that we've discussed in earlier uh, episodes. But you never know what can turn up. You never know what can turn up. So, you know, that's, that's exciting. Uh, has anyone heard of this Judge Crater case before? Again, I'll, I'll keep, and again, if you want to mention another case, please, please, please. Okay, Kathy, so there's another one we can add to the list for ongoing study. And I know we all are so, have our regular lives, and then we get interested in these cases. So it's hard to get to everything all the time. Okay, now one of us mentioned, and I'm going to just jump to it now, uh, Evelyn Hartley. Um, which was a, a case I find uh, very interesting. And again, just for so that we have context here. Okay, there's the Potomatic. And then here's the YouTube link. Okay. And I'm going to post that here in our chat for your reference. Again, we have the Potomatic link here. And I'm going to not start it. So um, the website there, Sherlock, just using his 
his uh, his name there, or Anthony, uh, crime blogger 1983.blogspot.com. He covers other cases too, but uh, he was a guest there on Unfound. The Evelyn Grace Hartley, again, I've mentioned it in other, at least one other episode for this. Um, you know, we're going back to the 1950s. You know, a lot of interesting things pertaining to that case. You can see there in terms of the type of research, research that the level of intensity and focus for research that we've talked about and that we're committed to with this group and Ed's committed to and so forth. Right. Well, that's one. I know someone here, and again, I'm tracking the chat as best as possible. One of you mentioned the Evelyn Hartley case. Right. There's another one. Please listen to or re listen to that episode if you have not already. And I'm just going to right now just go right from Ed's description, right on the Potomatic page. Um, Evelyn Grace Hartley was a 15 year old from La Crosse, Wisconsin. She was a popular girl who didn't mind studying on a Friday night. On October 24th, 1953, she was babysitting for the first time at the home of the Rasmussen's. At 8.30 p.m., Evelyn's father called to see how she was doing. There was no answer. Worried, he drove over to see Evelyn and found the house had been broken into. Evelyn was gone. She was never seen again. On the, pot of my, on the Potomatic page, like usual, Ed provides some, some resources that you can go to. Uh, Gene Spangler case. Okay, Gene Spangler. Thank you, Linda. There's another one that we can add to the mix. And again, we have a record of this through this video and through the chat. And who knows? We're, we're likely someday going to do another follow-up, um, ongoing, etc. cetera, uh, interest in historical cases. So we'll be noting these. It's, it's available so Gene Spangler, anyone want to, want to comment on Gene Spangler or on Evelyn Hartley as I uh, move through there? And uh, I want to mention that um, one that I also like, and I've mentioned this elsewhere, off, not on unfound publications or episodes, I don't think, but elsewhere, that I the Clem Graver case that Sherlock covers on his website, and I'm going to post the link. It's fascinating. If you have time to look at it, okay, um, it is a um, it's interesting, and and Sherlock provides a lot of references and historical material. And uh, just a lot of it. And if you wanted to do your own research, and Sherlock, uh, toward the end of that page, works in some, some thoughts, but just the reference material and so forth. I think the Clem Graver case is fascinating. Again, we're, we're going back into the 50s, and I won't get into a lot of the, the details here, but if you want to take some time and, and look at the, the Clem Graver case, for sure, um, it's one that I would recommend. You know, um, we've talked about so many things pertaining to research and why it's so important to take it seriously. I mean, I, uh, digging into those older cases are, are fascinating to me. Again, those people matter over time. I do believe maybe the truth can come out. It helps raise awareness for missing persons cases in general. We see how missing persons cases have, especially the coverage thereof, can have an impact on how missing persons cases are handled, law enforcement, legal, political, so forth. Obviously, we see with a lot of these cases, both the well-known ones and the, the not so well-known ones, even, even folks you know, in, as we've talked about before, inaccuracies tend to get recycled or re-reported, even by well-meaning and sincere people, even people grappling with different ideas of what happened. Okay, there can be legitimate debate, but we got to keep getting to that truth. And so, I mean, for me, you know, both as someone who does the, you know, uh, as a as a academic scholar and you know and i'm not a criminologist i'm a communication scholar but i have research skills and then doing freelance journalism freelance and you know on the side so to speak 
on on cold cases. Uh, you got to put the time in. We know that as as folks who are committed to sort of the mission of Unfound, you got to look at the documents. You got to put in the time. Um, one way to think about coverage too, and I'm going to mention a case that I keep mentioning, right? The Nicholas Masucci case, and this is one again that after hearing Ed's interview of Fran and the Masucci case, right? I said, uh, I'm going to run with this. And, you know, this was a fascinating case. Now, uh, Mr. Masucci disappeared in 1974. And, um, you know, this is, this is um, a case that um, is, is interesting here. Now, I've done... You know, again, after listening to Ed's tremendous uh, interview uh, of Fran, there were so many important things in there that raised more questions, right, and and pointed in certain directions, what's known, what's unknown, right, just like any thorough. So starting to dig into that, right, Mary, the Mary Farrell site, other government sites, newspapers.com. Okay, learning a lot of things, running with it, okay, more on that in the future, but uh, one of the things you start to talk about coverage, right? Well, as far as I can tell, to this point in time, I have found no media coverage of this other than Ed's program and you know missing persons websites, etc. I'm talking about at that time, at that time newspaper tv now to be fair i've not had a chance yet to start contacting you know because there aren't as many tv and radio archives out there as there are newspaper archives so i'm not saying that it's not out there i've not found it and i still have to do some work of finding connecting to you know radio tv and it may also be the case that in terms of newspaper that the newspaper that might have covered it even with a small blurb is just not online. So I'm not saying it's not out there. I'm just saying with extensive research, I've not found it. Okay. Now, in the 1970s, in the region or locally, even with the case that's possibly connected to organized crime, certainly does, does the lack of coverage say anything about the case? Maybe, maybe not. You know, it might just be that it didn't get any coverage, right? But it might, there might or might not be more to that, and it, and I won't say that I haven't thought about that in in conversation in, in my own reflections or even in conversations with with sources. But um, point is, it's kind of interesting in the 1970s when there were a lot of folks who were disappearing or found dead, particularly if they had an alleged connection to organized crime. Um, that did make it to the media. Now, many didn't. Okay, that we can get into that as a as a circumstance or a problem too, and 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 more study could be done on that. I'm assuming that many didn't, or some number didn't. But even that notion, right? Just the sort of the 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 amount or lack thereof of coverage, even later in time, right? Now, again, now with Ed's program and. Charlie Project and other databases. Obviously, we have points of reference. Ed's interview is great. Listen to it um, for sure. Um, and that, you know, that's just an example, right? When you think about that going forward. Any other cases that anyone wants to mention? Because I have another one. Okay. To add to our lists, I have another one. Okay, let me go to, of course, this is one, Amelia Earhart. Okay, this is one that's definitely on the historical aspects of America. And one that, to this day, well, the, I mean, there are some, some discussions. Now, the uh, AmeliaEarhart.com site, um, a M well, Amelia Earhart, A M E L I A E A R H A R T dot com, uh, has seems to have 
Okay, so I go to the achievement section is where I find some the link to the um, an article from 2017, and this is on their site. So, um, and it has some some other resources that that they link to, and you can, if you're interested in, you can evaluate for yourself about mystery deepens over bones linked to Amelia Earhart. So uh, just through following, um, I'm not sure if this would count. What, oh, yeah, Escape from Alcatraz. Uh, again, yes, I've not followed that. I don't know to what extent that there's been any uh, research or development on that. But, yeah, I mean, from my point of view, um, why wouldn't we consider these um, missing People know we normally say, uh, unless someone is breaking some sort of law or fraud, that to, to, to kind of change your context isn't necessarily a crime. Um, but obviously, you can't escape from prison if you're a convicted prisoner. So that would definitely be a problem. But they're still missing persons. Uh, again, I never kept up on that, but to the extent that those folks were or weren't discovered. So that's that's a good one, Linda. I have uh, some material here then about Earhart. And, um, and so in that, um, in that uh, article, um, there's a mentioning of the Earhart Project and um, by a group of uh, T-I-G-H-A-R, looks to be a group, tied to uh, air airport uh, uh, aircraft recovery issues. Uh, wow, okay, Natasha, interesting. Uh, Earhart Hall, uh, as a freshman at Purdue, there was a display with her goggles and other items. Interesting. Have you taken much interest in the case, Natasha? So I put some stuff up there about the Earhart Project. Um, this organization, of course, is claiming to have some viable argument about the, um, what they call viable evidence or genuine evidence of Amelia Earhart's fate. I will let you determine that or, or sift through it. Again, I am not an expert on the Earhart case, not extraordinary, so... Linda, I don't remember where I heard it, but supposedly they survived and went to South America and lived as farmers. They sent a picture to the family. Again, I'm not going to comment on any particular ideas tonight of it, but again, especially with, I mean, there's, there's, there are different, um, right, and so there are different. And you can you can follow the links what what I'm sending, um, what's out there. There is a um, yeah, there is a uh, uh, you know some discussion out there you can follow. Uh, I'm not in any way an expert on it. I think it's it, I I sort of always generally. In my life, just as an American citizen, obviously we see it mentioned in, in various aspects of media or schooling uh, programs. It is fascinating, right, historically. Um, I've seen a little bit over the years about, you know, the, the um, you know, ideas about the, the disappearance. I am familiar that there's been some newer material they've been looking at. This this uh, idea about South America can't remember if I heard it, although that could be interesting, and if there's evidence to, to at least to support a, uh, a, uh, some speculation about that, great, uh, for sure. Anyone else have any have had any interest in the Amelia Earhart case? Okay, for sure. So we have that. So I've, I've posted some materials there. And again, I'll work with Natasha on catching up on data gems. And again, it's my 
problem, my fault, thought Natasha and Ed's. But that page is ongoing. But again, nice thing about this new format is I can post some of these links real time. I hope that's helpful. Seems like it is. If anyone wants to comment on that openly or directly to Ed or myself. So let's let's walk it back here. I've mentioned a number of cases. Does anyone have any other cases that they want to to mention um, regarding the uh, prominent or even not prominent missing persons cases historically? Certainly in the future, we're going to do this again as a follow up episode because there's just so much to the history. Right. If anyone has any thoughts. Okay, so let's recap a little bit here. So does anyone have any, and I've mentioned some areas where why I think learning this history is so important, studying this history is so important, right? It's it, the, the cases matter, prominent or not. Justice matters, truth matters, okay? Uh, we can learn from these cases in terms of good research, accuracy, truth, debate, argumentation, all the things that we've talked about are quite fascinating to research. Again, not from a morbid, morbid standpoint or sensationalism standpoint, but really being interested in, in learning about it and, and, and learning maybe what to do, what not to do, okay, etc. What thoughts do we have about why studying this history is so important? If anyone wants to chime in, again, why is it important to, 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 to understand the history of these missing persons cases, either in the specific cases or in general? If anyone wants to, to chime in, okay? From my point of view, I would, you know, obviously you all have your own, uh, this, this group are obviously folks who are really interested in these things, right? Folks that Okay, Linda helps to see how investigations have been improved upon. Absolutely. You go back to the Charlie Ross case. You go back through the various cases we've looked at and others. Obviously, okay, science has improved. Yes, by the way, in the future, another episode idea we have does pertain to forensic science. And, and again, I'm not a forensic scientist, but there are things out there that we can go to, to learn about it. Okay. Uh, also, though, too, in terms of, you know, besides the science, besides the technology, right, there are all sorts of um, ways. And by the way, not just law enforcement, right, media, right, looking at it, media. And this is, is an area as a communication uh, person that would be of interest to me, right? I'm not a, a mass communication scholar. I'm a, a rhetorical studies and uh, but have an interest in media. And as a citizen, right, I want media to get it right. And so even as journalists uh, and so forth are involved in these cases and reporting of these cases and being both effective and, and ethical along the way. So, yeah, I think the improvement, and maybe there's ways that we have improved. I mean, improvements happen over time, but there are ways that certainly we still need to get better um forensics people's habits right back to prevention great one kathy relationships law enforcement right government entities private entities absolutely for sure anyone else want to chime in right why is this history important and as as folks might be typing or thinking of typing let me say again i know we're all busy and i know we're really getting interested in cases um linda Coverage of disappearances still seem to be biased. Again, this links back to our last episode. And again, notwithstanding one's politics, right, there's a lot of legitimate discussions about how case, how we as the public perceive cases in general or specific cases, how media is reporting on it, uh, and so forth. Yep. How are missing, Natasha, how are missing persons placed as a societal priority in general or lack thereof, history of police and investigator involvement. Absolutely. Certainly there are people, historians, criminologists, media scholars, and so forth that are dealing with these issues. We saw that in the last episode, um, right? And just the idea of missing persons in general or particular people or with particular demographics, those are real questions that need to be addressed in my mind. So I would encourage all of us, and again, I know we're busy. I know we're already interested in missing persons cases. But just as a sort of, uh, as you have time, 
maybe whether it's a case we've mentioned tonight or some other case you know about through Unfound or elsewhere that's been reported on in some level or even not so much. Take some of the things that we've discussed over the months in terms of research and analysis and do some of your own digging and get to know the case. Just pick one historical case and share some of that information, the credible information uh, in terms of primary sources and secondary sources. Of course, there are a number of cases, many, many, many cases through Unfound that have some scope of history to them. Um, don't always have to be prominent cases, although we've talked about some tonight. So, you know, I myself, again, really, again, it's, it's uh, the historical cases are important as such. There's some challenge to it, but, you know, we don't do it for some sort of just like primarily for some gratification because we care about the cases. We try to care about the people, but they are an important adventure that needs to be these cases are important adventures that need to be pursued because the truth matters and the people matter, right? The families matter, the friends matter, and so forth. If anyone else has any final comments, as always, please text them. Let me go back again. I'll stand. Okay, it's our first time tonight in this, this format. Bear with me as I'm getting used to it. Um, again, I'm broadcasting from an undisclosed location. Uh, over time, I'll do better with things like broad uh, background and so forth. Um, there are a few local cases, Linda, that have really been bugging you. I assume you mean they have some, some historical scope to them. So maybe tonight, Linda, and, and maybe you collaborate with some of us at your discretion. Um, talk to Ed, talk to me, and maybe we can we can just let's talk about it. It's up to Ed, of course, who gets what gets covered on unfound, but he's encouraging collaboration. Linda, you more than have the tools and the, the interest to, to, to do that. So maybe that's part of it too, right? We get an inclination. Uh, thank you, Paul. Or you're welcome, Paula. Thanks from Paula for these cases. Um, yeah, this time I, I tried to keep it very general, Kathy. And it was just, are there any cases that, that you know of and what's the importance of all this next time we're going to get, probably get back to uh, specific maybe four, three or four questions. And, and the next time through, we're going to talk about some laws and policies and acts that have been passed. That'll be our August episode. I just had the two tonight I mentioned in the email, and it was, I know, kind of last minute. Are there any cases you'd like to mention, and, and why is this important? Yeah, We're going to keep that going, Kathy. It wasn't as extensive for tonight. Linda, you, you should have my email. You can always contact Ed if there's something you want to bring me in. My emails that I send out uh, coming from that that account, I'm not going to mention it here, but you can just reach out to Ed too, and then if he wants to bring me in, uh, please. Uh, and so that hopefully that answer. And Kathy, hopefully I answered your questions. Uh, again, they were more just too. I don't want to say too general. Too they were too they were specific like esque. Okay. I just want to give folks a chance to share any cases they thought were important. I sent that uh, this, mor uh, this morning or early this afternoon. I was in a different time zone. It was when I sent out the YouTube link, Kathy. So apologies if you didn't receive it, but it was, you were on it. But the way technology is, it, it is what it is. And, and with this new format and trying to get ready for this, I... I, I should have sent that earlier, and I apologize. But but we made it, and I and we're we're all getting better together, and I appreciate that. Uh, okay, folks, this has been great work. Again, let me just finish with the usual: theunfoundpodcast.com, theunfoundpodcast.com. Especially if you're watching this later, please visit that site, share that site. Uh, appreciate the work of the think uh, think tank folks. Okay, Kathy, I'll keep that in mind, um, and uh, we'll, we'll make sure that all folks can get that for sure. Uh, thank you, Natasha. Thank you, Linda. Thank you, Kathy. You're welcome to everyone. Thanks for everyone's participation. As I always say, someone out there knows something or knows someone who knows something. Keep ranch re researching and analyzing folks, and we'll keep an eye on your email and the Facebook uh, uh, group, Think Tank group private group 
for more information about the next episode. Thank you, sir. I'm now ending this stream. Thank you, folks. I am now ending this stream.